Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. This presentation is, in effect, neurophysiology in a nutshell for orthopedic surgeons who are preparing for the FRCS TNO examinations. It's, of course, it's a, an intrinsic part of your curriculum to understand how neurophysiology applies to the various regions of the body. I cannot go through every single aspect of this within this uh, 20 to 30 minute presentation um, but there are other resources available to you uh, by following links to the rest of this YouTube channel exploring with the neurophysiology puzzle cases uh, these other regions of the body that aren't covered today. In terms of an overview I will be presenting the basic principles of what we do talking a little bit about nerve injury the numbers that we use and we'll present a couple of cases with uh, worked examples as to how we use neurophysiology to answer the question as to what's the cause of the symptoms. There are three main modalities which we perform. We have the EEG where we look at the brain waves. We have nerve conduction studies and electromyography, the NCS EMG, where we look at primarily the large fiber pathways for the sensory nerves to their primary cell body, which is a dorsal root ganglion, and for the motor fibers to the anterior horn cell within the spinal cord. We have evoked potentials as well, which combine both the NCS and the EEG components and follows the signal across the entire pathway. For those of you who may not have seen how nerve conduction studies work, here is a picture of me testing someone's second digit. So that's obviously a median sensory nerve. And the way that we are doing this is with a stimulating um, electrodes, which pass the signal up. And you can see two recording electrodes in the black and the red here, and they pick up the signal. The reason we have two is to reduce the amount of noise and improve the signal. So it's giving us better signal to noise ratio. And we have a ground electrode in between, which allows us to make the patient electrically neutral to the equipment. Now, if we are passing the signal along the normal anatomical pathway, and direction of travel, so distal to central for the sensory nerves, then that's called an orthodromic study. Now, the advantage of doing this is we have a very nice clean signal. However, the amplitudes are smaller of these responses, primarily because as the nerve becomes more proximal, it becomes buried under more subcutaneous tissue and is therefore more distant from the recording electrodes and is therefore smaller. We can do the test in the opposite way around and do it antidromically, which has the advantage in this case of actually providing a larger amplitude response because there is less subcutaneous tissue between the recording electrodes if we had these over the fingers compared to the wrist. However, it would contain muscle contamination because not only will we be setting off the sensory fibers, but if we were to stimulate the same nerve at the wrist, we would also be getting muscle contraction of the um, median innervated muscles of the hand and that will contaminate the signal. So each has its own advantages and its own disadvantages, but in the UK, we try and do the finger two and finger five orthodromically, which is not necessarily the case elsewhere. Motor studies are different. So here we are not sending the signal along the nerve and picking up the response from the nerve. Here we are sending the signal across the nerve, but picking up the signal over the actual muscle. And we use a belly tendon montage setup. And so we have the active electrode here over the APB muscle in this example, and the indifferent electrode over its tendon more distally. And it's important to bear this in mind because we are not just having to take into account the nerve impulse along uh, the nerve itself, but we are also having to take consideration for the transmission across the neuromuscular junction and also uh, depolarization of the muscle fibers as well. This is what an EMG would look like. We use a very fine concentric needle electrode. That means there is a needle within a needle. So there's a very, very fine wire inside there and it's recording the potential difference between that central core and the outer metallic sheath, which you can see. And we are recording the potential differences of the muscles as they contract, they generate small electrical fields. And we can therefore have an electrical representation of how the muscle fibers are and how they are contracting. It's also very useful to consider the symptoms patients can have, dividing them up between sensory symptoms and motor symptoms. So sensory nerves will cause tingling, numbness, loss of dexterity, 
pain is not usually a feature unless there is an ischemic process going on or something infiltrative. So always be wary of a patient who's got progressive weakness, which is very painful because that might actually be something rather malignant. Motor nerves, when they become impaired, they lead to weakness, wasting of the muscles and fasciculations. Now, here is a diagram of uh, an axon and its myelin sheath and I'm sure you'll recall from medical school that as nerves depolarize um, they spread the electrical current from one ion channel to the next and if we were to just solely rely on that then the signals wouldn't get very fast or very far at all and so what we have are the myelin sheaths and the nodes of RANVA in between them which allow for saltatory conductance and these really greatly speed up the speed of conduction. So if we consider the axon and we consider the myelin in terms of our nerve conduction study, so the axon gives us the amplitude of the responses. And so for a sensory nerve, are called sensory nerve action potentials or SNAPs. For the motor fibers, we have the compound motor action potential or the CMAP. The myelin doesn't give us the amplitude, it gives us the conduction velocity. And so this, for the sensory nerves, we have the sensory nerve conduction velocities, the SNCVs, or for the motor nerve conduction velocities, those are the MNCVs. And you can see those on the data tables. So if we have a look now at a, a typical example of someone with axonal loss, so that's the top part of the diagram, so what one would expect to have is a reduction in the amplitude with essentially preserved velocity. Now as axonal loss increases, one has a phenomenon called fast fiber dropout, and then the conduction velocities can fall too. In a demyelinating lesion, one has primarily a reduction in the conduction velocity. Now, initially, the amplitudes should be preserved, but the amplitude can fall later on, either due to failure of saltatory conductance or to actual axonal loss itself. So here is uh, the healthy situation with the nerve signal being passed along at a nice rapid rate. If one has a diffuse loss of myelin sheath, then one gets a fairly uniform slowing of conduction across. And that's the typical situation that we see in conditions such as Charcot-Marie Tooth, where there is a predominantly demyelinating phenotype to that. The most common uh, form of demyelination that you'll come across is, of course, focal demyelination. And in this example, you'll see what will happen is, is that the nerve impulse will be trundling along, it will slow down at that point of loss of myelin, and then it will gradually speed up again. If there is more significant loss of myelin, there will be further slowing of conduction. And if there's very severe loss of myelin, the actual axon itself may even be damaged by this point, and one can come to a phenomenon called conduction block. The most common causes of these compression neuropathies are carpal tunnel, cubital tunnel, comperineal nerve lesions across the fibular neck. So when we're looking for demyelination, we're looking to see what the pattern of that is. Is it a single entrapment site? In which case we might be thinking about a common compression neuropathy, such as those that I've already just mentioned. If we're seeing them at multiple entrapment sites, well, there might still be common uh, compression neuropathies, or we might need to start thinking about conditions such as HNPP, where there's a genetic problem with the myelin sheath leading to a susceptibility to these type of problems. There might be multiple nerves showing demyelination at non-entrapment sites, in which case we have to start thinking more neurologically, medically with Guillain-Barre syndrome, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathies and various variants of those. But if we see generalized diffuse slowing, we need to start thinking about the uh, hereditary motor sensory neuropathies, the Charcot-Marie tooth diseases, and uh, that's something which is actually quite relevant to any of you in a foot clinic um, where that might be a consideration. If we have a look now at how sensory studies work and what we will see on our screen and what we do. So in this example, I'm stimulating distally. I'm recording proximally. So this is an orthodromic study. We know the time point where we are stimulating. We know the takeoff point where the signal is appearing. And if we take our tape measure, which is why you often see us wearing a tape measure, we can look at the distance between those two points and work out the speed as simply speed is distance divided by time. And so that provides us with our sensory nerve conduction velocity. The actual signal here will have a peak and we'll measure that for our sensory nerve action potential, our snap amplitude. And these are the two main parameters which we will be looking at. There are, of course, other ways of looking at this too, but these are the principal ways that we look at it.
Let's have a look with the motor studies. Now remember before, we were talking about the fact that for a motor study, we are recording not over the nerve itself, but over the muscle belly. And so when we stimulate the nerve distally, the signal has to go across the nerve, it's got to go across the neuromuscular junction, and then it's got to start depolarizing the muscle, and then you start getting the contraction itself. And because there's some variability in all of that between different people, and the time periods are very, very short in between uh, all of these different events, we just record what's known as the distal motor latency, and that's the time between stimulating the nerve and the start of the contraction. So that's the distal motor latency, or the DML. And the amplitude of this response is called the CMAP, as I've talked about before. If we then stimulate the same nerve a bit more proximally, we can then look at the distance between the second stimulation point and the distal stimulation point, measure the difference there, and then get a conduction velocity of that nerve segment of the motor fibers. Okay, so that's where the motor nerve conduction velocities are calculated from. And we can work our way more proximally. We also have the ability to measure something called the F wave. So in health, we know that there is voltage gating and there's time gating to make sure that a signal goes in one single direction only. So if we are sending a signal from our brain down to our hand, for example, to contract, the signal goes in one way. However, what we're doing with our nerve conduction tests is not the natural order of things. And when we depolarize the nerve, the signal in fact goes in both directions. So the signal will cause depolarization down towards the muscle, which is what we're picking up. However, some of that will also go up to the anterior horn cells, it will stimulate some of those, and they will cause an after depolarization, which occurs a fair time later on um, of the actual muscle that you're recording. And so this is called the F wave. Now, in order to test exactly what's going on, we need to and make our lesion localization, we have to test multiple nerves and we test multiple locations. And the most basic thing that we need to be able to do is to differentiate between pre and post ganglionic processes. So a post ganglionic process is in effect the peripheral neuropathies. And because we're testing from the dorsal root ganglion and more distally, Anything that will impair or the function of the nerve tissue or the dorsal root ganglion will lead to a reduction in the sensory responses for a post-ganglionic process. However, if something is occurring more proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, then the sensory responses will be unaffected, and this is called a pre-ganglionic process. Now, there are lots of different causes for preganglionic lesions. Of course, there are the standard surgical type of, of causes, herniated discs, uh, spondylosis, spinal stenosis. There are mass lesions, whether they be abscesses or tumors. There might be vascular causes, for example, AVMs. And there are also medical causes, which you need to be aware of, the most important of which being motor neuron disease and, of course, TB and Lyme, amongst a couple of others, too. I've mentioned before evoked potentials. Here we can actually have a look at the entire pathway. So for a sensory nerve, we can stimulate that distally. We can track the signal up across the lumbar or cervical regions up to the brain itself. And we can look at the time points that those signals arrive there. We can do the opposite as well for the motor pathways where we use a magnet, usually in awake patients, to stimulate the motor cortex. That signal will go down the spinal cord, down to the anterior horn cells, and then work its way peripherally. Now, we know that we can work out the time it takes from the F wave for the a signal to go from the anterior horn cell down to the muscle so you then just have to subtract out the time it takes from the motor cortex um, downwards from all of that and then you can get something called the central motor conduction time. This is also a very interesting technique, a very useful technique for patients with feigned illnesses um, and are unable to move and yet are one is able to uh, magnetically stimulate their cortex uh, into creating uh, motion. Let's briefly talk about EMG. So we've already mentioned to use a concentric needle. We're recording the um, muscle motor unit action potentials, or the MUPs, as we call them. And we can see how the muscle's been controlled by the brain. So that's the recruitment patterns. And we can see how much muscle fiber is present. That's the interference pattern. So the more muscle fibers that are being activated, the more signal there is on the screen and the fuller the interference pattern. 
We can see the electrical characteristics of the muscles, whether they might be myopathic, for example, or whether there is a neurogenic process going on. We can see what degree of external continuity is present in nerve lesions, and we can also assess and look for signs of recovering. Now I have a separate video which really goes into the nitty gritty of the external lesions and how nerves regenerate and you can look at that by clicking on the i-card above but the very bare bones of this can be summarized as follows. So denervated muscles will upregulate their acetylcholine receptors. Now that makes muscle membranes irritable because they are being partially depolarized by the acetylcholine around them. We detect this as fibrillations and positive sharp waves on our EMG. Now this process can take between two and a half to four weeks and that depends on Wallerian degeneration. So when there's a nerve lesion and Wallerian degeneration is occurring, the nerves degenerate backwards. And so for the upper limbs, which are shorter in length than the lower limbs, this process is somewhat quicker and that's why it's about two and a half weeks for the upper limbs and about up to four weeks for the lower limbs. Now in a purely neuropraxic lesion where the nerve is just stunned, the nerve is still in continuity with the muscle. Hence, the muscle will not upregulate the acetylcholine receptors. So when you stick the needle in, there will be silence. There'll be electrical silence for about six to eight weeks and then hopefully, uh, you know, with time, um, that will start to improve. The flip side is a complete axonal lesion where there will be just fibrillations after the time it takes for layer and degeneration to occur and upregulation of the acetylcholine receptors, but there will be no recruitable motor units because no signal is able to get down. Partial lesions in between, and that's the, the most common uh, variety uh, or, or mixed lesions as well, are the most common form of nerve lesion that we will see. One will get disorderly recruitment, so the signals aren't uh, getting down there and, and the muscles are not being activated in the usual uh, orderly manner that we would expect them to be. And we'll have a reduction in the interference patterns and there'll be variable amounts of fibrillations present too. In regeneration, the surviving axons start to re-innovate the denervated muscles, and this will result in large complex motor unit potentials, which I'll show you uh, an example of now. So this is in a very chronic phase, and if there was one word to describe this, it sounds like popcorn. It's a very dull sound because the units are very broad. Um, you can see that there are only a couple of motor units here on the screen, and that's because there's been such a loss of muscle fiber here that there isn't that much uh, present. Let's talk about numbers now. So of course numbers are a complex uh, topic and uh, nothing's ever perfect, but here are some easy numbers to remember in clinic. Of course, uh, nothing's absolutely perfect with all of this. And so you will have to trust your neurophysiologist um, in terms of you know what's normal, what's not normal, but it's really important to have some idea roughly speaking uh, in terms of data interpretation. Now just a couple of rules you have to remember. Conduction velocities increase the more proximally you stimulate and that's because the nerves are warmer and they're larger and so the velocities increase because of that. We also have a 50% rule so if you've got data from both sides if you see reduction of more than 50% on one side that's an abnormal side and we have what I call the rule of fives. So if we take a 40 year old patient there are only a couple of nerves here to really think about. So for the ulna, digit five, median, digit two, and for the superficial radial, we just say five, 10, and 15 microvolts. That's millionths of a volt. Okay, so the amplitude, so for the ulna will be five uh, millionths of a volt, the median 10, and for the radial will be 15. The velocities should be about 50 meters per second. If you double that, so someone at the age of 80, you can basically halve the amplitudes, okay? So an ulna of two and a half, median of five, superficial radial of about seven and a half as low limits of normal. And the velocities can decrease a little bit by about five meters per second to about 45 uh, meters per second. If you half the age, let's say to the age of 20, you can basically double the amplitude, so 10, 20, 30, and you can also increase the velocities a little bit to about 55 or so meters per second as low limits of normal. So that's a very easy way 
of thinking about three sensory nerves, three very important sensory nerves in the upper limb. We can do something very similar in the lower limb with the two main sensory nerves that we test for the sorrel and for the superficial perineal, again, five and 10. So if a sorrel is a, at um, the age of 40 is about 10 microvolts, at the age of 80, it might only be five microvolts. Or if you go even younger at the age of 20, it might be 20 microvolts. So that's pretty easy. And again, the velocities might be 35 for a old patient, it might be 40 for a middle-aged patient, and about 45 plus for a younger patient. Now, the motor amplitudes and studies are a little bit more complex, but again, if we just think about rules of five, it just makes life very simple. Um, we can get our get through most studies just sort of understanding those numbers. So for the ulna, we have the ADM. For the medium, we use the APB. For the perineal, we use the EDB. And for the tibial, we use the AH muscles respectively. And the DMLs are three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, and six and a half milliseconds respectively. Now, if there's one number you really do need to really recall from all of this is in terms of carpal tunnel, and that's the median APB, which is a distal motor latency of four and a half. Once you see a distal motor latency of four and a half milliseconds, you're thinking about a moderate carpal tunnel lesion, and therefore um, that's a really important number to bear in mind. In terms of upper limb conduction velocities, um, roughly about 50 meters per second in the upper limb, 40 meters per second in the lower limb, similar to the sensory um, velocities that we were talking about before. And in terms of the amplitudes, again, in multiples of five. Um, so for the median APB, lower limb, it's roughly about five millivolts. For the ulnar ADM, roughly about 10. For the EDB, two and a half. For the AH, about five. And then for the F responses, these very much vary on height of a patient, but roughly speaking, um, less than 33 milliseconds uh, in the upper limb and less than 55 milliseconds in the lower limb. Let's go through a couple of cases. So here we've got a 39 year old lady with a tingling right hand. So let's have a look at the sensory responses and we just go through this line by line. So for the right median F2, we have an amplitude of five microvolts and a conduction velocity of 35 meters per second. Now the amplitude is reduced, that's less than 10 and the conduction velocity is slow, okay? Because that's less than um, 50 meters per second. The ulna F5 response, that's got an amplitude of 10. So that's almost double what the, the finger two response was. So there's a, there's a problem with that right finger two. And its conduction of velocity is 54. So the ulna response is fine. It's the median response, which is small and slow. If we had any doubt, if we um, couldn't remember our numbers, we can have a look at the other side. So for the left finger two, that's 21 microvolts. So we, in context, we can see that the uh, right finger two is actually quite significantly reduced. That's only five versus 21 on the healthy side. And its conduction velocity is 63 meters per second. So that's going nice and blisteringly fast. The left ulna finger five is a normal amplitude, so that's 11 microvolts and a normal conduction velocity. Let's have a look at the motor conduction velocities now. So the distal motor latency for the right APB is 5.7 milliseconds. Now that's significantly longer than the four and a half milliseconds, which is the upper uh, limit um, for which um, significant prolongation is um, present. On the left side, in case we had any uh, lapse of our memory, that's only 3.2 milliseconds. The motor amplitude, well, it's a bit reduced on the uh, right side, not significantly, but it's a little bit reduced, 8.7 millivolts, that's thousandths of a volt, um, versus the left side, which is 12 millivolts, so 12 thousandths of a volt. For the ulna um, motor distally, um, we can see it's 2.1 milliseconds, uh, both sides and normal amplitudes as well. So the first question we have to consider, is this a pre or a post ganglionic process? So clearly this is a post ganglionic process because we have got impairment of the sensory responses. And here we've got significant slowing and attenuation of sensory uh, responses from the right median nerve. And also the motor fibers are also impaired as well.
There are a variety of carpal tunnel uh, syndrome grading scales in terms of the neurophysiology. In the UK, the most common one uh, that you might will probably come across is the Canterbury scale by Jeremy Bland. Um, and here it's got six uh, different grades, or seven if you can count grade zero, and it goes from normal to extremely severe. And you can see here for the grade three, which is the most important in terms of uh, surgeons. Um, so the moderate has a preserved snap, a preserved sensory nerve action potential, um, but the distal motor latency is beyond four and a half milliseconds uh, and, and here up to six and a half milliseconds. So between four and a half and six and a half um, with a preserved snap is a moderate carpal tunnel lesion. Let's talk about another case. Again, a 36 year old lady with a tingling hand. Let's have a look line by line here at the data. So for the right finger two, we can see an amplitude of 25 microvolts and a velocity of 59. So that's normal. For the right ulna uh, finger five, we've got an amplitude of 3.1 microvolts. So that's small and a normal conduction velocity of 51 meters per second. For the right, for the left median F2, that's normal, so that's 21 microvolts with a normal conduction velocity. And for the left ulna finger five, um, we have a normal amplitude here of 11 microvolts with a normal conduction velocity. So even if you can't remember the absolute numbers, if you can just look relatively between the two sides, you can see it's quite a significant drop from the right ulna finger five response, which is just 3.1 microvolts versus that on the left side, the unaffected left side, which is 11 microvolts, so three versus 11. If we have a look at the motor conduction uh, velocity and data um, over here for the APB, so normal distal motor latency of 3.2, we've got a normal amplitude of 12 millivolts, we've got an F latency here of 29 milliseconds, those are all very normal. Let's have a look for the right ulna ADM response. So we've got a normal distal motor latency of 2.1 milliseconds, conduction velocity from wrist to below the elbow, in other words, the forearm is 45 meters per second. Now recall that as we test more proximally, the conduction velocities should be increasing. So when we go around the elbow, it actually drops to 32 meters per second. Contrast that with the left-hand side, which has gone from 44 meters per second up to 54 meters per second. So there's a significant fall here in terms of the conduction velocity. Let's have a look at the motor amplitude. So we've got 8.6 millivolts here at the wrist which is a little bit lower than the contralateral side. We have a, uh, a, a stimulation point below the elbow, that's 8.5 millivolts. So that's not significantly fallen. However, when we stimulate above the elbow, that's only 4.1 millivolts. And so there's a degree of conduction block going on. Um, and so that's a, an abnormality, it's significantly fallen. The F latency here has gone up to 33 milliseconds. So for the right APB, it was 29 milliseconds. For the right ADM, it's 33 milliseconds. For the, if we just compare that to the left side, that was 29 milliseconds. So there is um, slowing of conduction across the elbow here. So it's dropped from 45 to 32 milliseconds. And that's also impacted on the F wave as well. And we have a Padua grading scale for ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. Um, and this would be a case of a moderate um, impairment here where we've got significant conduction slowing across the elbow and impairment of the sensory nerve action potential as well. Final case now, um, a, a 54 year old gentleman now with a tingling hand. So if we just look line by line here um, for the right median um, F2 response, that's very normal, 25 microvolts. Um, for the right ulna F5, 13 microvolts is also very normal. So there's no evidence of a uh, postganglionic process here because the sensories are normal. And you can compare that to the other side too on the left. Let's have a look at the motor conduction velocities. So for the right APB studies, um, so we've got a distal motor latency of 3.2 milliseconds, so that's equal, normal, symmetrical. The motor amplitude of 12 millivolts, again, that's normal. The F latency is a little bit longer than on the left side, uh, but not distinctly so. Let's have a look at the ulna ADM data. Distal motor latency is 2.1 milliseconds. That's normal and uh, equal and symmetrical. Conduction velocity uh, in the forearm is 45 meters per second. That's normal, symmetrical. Conduction velocity around the elbow has it's, it's gone up in, in velocity, 55, and that's normal and symmetrical to the other side. The motor amplitudes are a little bit reduced compared to the other side, and the F latency is a little bit prolonged, uh, in, again, in contrast to the other side. So we haven't really got 
a specific answer as yet. And therefore we're going to have a look now at EMG. Now on the EMG, we can see uh, a description here of the denervation changes in the right triceps, EDC, and first dorsal interosseous muscles with moderate chronic denervatory changes described there with normal signals from the biceps and from the brachioradialis. And so what we're dealing with here is a preganglionic process at uh, the right C7 and C8 levels. Now, were we to have a scenario where a patient has got sensory symptoms and normal nerve conductions and normal EMG, what we could then go on and do is the SSCPs and have a look at the sensory uh, routes and, and the sensory pathways to see if they've been um, impacted upon proximal to the dorsal root ganglion. So, in summary, what makes a, a good referral? Um, timing is very important for lesional um, issues and repeat studies might be necessary. It's always really important to have a clear hypothesis. This is seldom an issue with orthopedic referrals. Um, it's really important not to frighten patients um, in advance of the test because it makes our job twice as hard um, when we have anxious patients. Um, these are really fairly benign studies, They're really not such a, a, a big deal. Yes, for some patients they will be uncomfortable, but for the vast majority um, they'll be able to put up with any discomfort cause and won't have any problems. If you have any questions um, in advance of the studies um, about any aspect, then of course please you know, don't be afraid to ask. And also if you don't believe the conclusion, I always encourage people to ask as well. Um, it's very important that we maintain uh, dialogue and uh, it's not as if we don't make mistakes ourselves. If you want more information, you've got the rest of this channel to have a look at, um, and uh, particularly with the neurophysiology puzzles, and they cover um, a lot of the other body regions uh, listed um, within the syllabus. And uh, many thanks for watching, and I wish everyone tremendous success uh, with their FRCS TNO um, fellowship exams.